was rebadged the Lawrence uh, Livermore time sharing system. They had that. Then they said, well, you know, these folks do classified work, so we can't release it to customers. So they wrote another similar looking system called uh, Cray Operating System Coast. And that uh, around that time, then they felt that they couldn't, when they came out with Cray 2, it, it was such a different architecture, they realized we can't just keep doing this. So they looked to Unix to provide, and they wrote uh, in less than three weeks, there was just a thousand uh, line program that knew exactly what the hardware looked like. And on top was all the general purpose C language code here. And so they took three weeks, rewrote that part, recompiled it on a DEC VAX 11750. And then the object code that it produced, they just loaded it and it booted up in the first go. So that was uh, something when they uh, told the uh, early writers of uh, Unix about that, they came by took a look and they said, yep, yeah. and they peeked at the source and they said, works beautifully. Unix has been ported to as many as 68 different architectures, and uh, you know you could do the same with Linux now. But then a few things happened. Um, in between then, from 16 to 64, then they started having more and more processors, and at that time, they had to write specific microkernels, and the most famous one was Chorus, that came actually out of a lab from France that were these tiny little kernels that you put on each one of the processors and they communicate with lightweight processes amongst each other. And around the same time, Linux first appeared on, in form of the Beowulf cluster. And I've got a couple of slides that detail that uh, move a little forward. Um, before that, Linux and microprocessors, they kind of share the same history. The cause of microprocessors Linux really got the prominence, and uh, uh, this was one of the slides from that attack of the killer micros in 92, and where he said the supercomputer, we're going slow, but these are coming up, and somewhere around there, which actually happened around 93 is when that first Linux cluster appeared with the micros. Next slide, uh, they were able to do it. Their inspiration came from now, network of workstations. And if you all remember, workstations used to cost about 30 grand each, Sun Microsystems, uh, DEC, Apollo, many of these workstations. You can still find them on eBay. You would connect them with uh, 10 megabit Ethernet on a local area network. And uh, with the software available at that time, you could take some simulation and distribute it all over. They said, well, why don't we just take out the processor boards bolt them all together like this and see what that does. Next slide. And uh, that was it. They had about 133 processor boards from old workstations that they put together. And uh, NASA Caltech, they called it the cube, and Stone was at another site. They put that together. And the original people who did that was Thomas Sterling and Don Becker. Uh, next slide. Uh, that's what it uh, looked like, was one of the implementations. It was just lots of wire, little console here, a bunch of machines, and at the other slide, the next slide, um, this is what it was, all these workstations, and you can see the gaggle of wires up there, the network switches, and that's where Linux, for the first time, said, I can do whatever high-performance computing can do, I can do it cheaper, and I can do it with open source stuff. And people took it seriously, and this is again 1992, 93, 94. After that, it's been no looking back, and I got some data graph to share about that also. That's actually the book uh, that he published. Uh, like I said, he did that at NASA Caltech, then later he moved to LSU, and since last year, uh, I think uh, October 2012, he actually moved to Indiana University and he's uh, part of the high-performance computing out there. Next slide. Um, but what were the pieces? It wasn't just the operating system. It was actually the whole family of things that you could find out there. Uh, there was actually a uh, piece of software that was written and used in Tennessee called Parallel Virtual Machine. And remember, virtualization was unknown. It didn't exist today. You didn't have VMware or anything. We're again talking 94, 93. This chap, uh, he, he wrote PVM so that would allow different parts of either one gigantic program 
or parts of individual little programs. Each one writes a piece of code, but you can talk to each other with PBM. They did it. And then that was replaced by MPI. And again, some of the same people were involved. This time, they had the US government uh, to help them out. And today, we have a formal standard and a formal body, MPI Forum. Pretty soon, they're going to release MPI 3. Open MPI, MPH, they're all open source versions of these standards. And there's even future work on how can we extend this to use about millions of processors in one single system. Next slide. Um, and what are the things? Well, I think I sort of alluded to that in the picture. Low cost, open source. Elasticity means that, oh, you want more compute? Let's put in more uh, copies of uh, workstations or nodes. It could stretch in any dimension you like. And then, of course, um, everything that you wanted to do, it wasn't imbalanced. It would equally spread the work out amongst all the different components. And if you think about it, that's where the seeds of cloud computing today, as we know it, came from there. Because the work doesn't know I have to run on this node or this machine name. It would transport it here, transport it there. And that's what is cloud computing today. Of course, we had lots of uh, issues at that time. There's no cluster management software. But today, there is, in fact, Linux offers probably almost like 50 different packages that are there for industrial people that provide that. And of course, we had known failures and they've got software to overcome that. Next slide. Thank you. And then this inspired several research institutions and several uh, even uh, commercial outfits to produce a whole bunch of these things. Uh, Linux uh, high availability or there's one uh, Ubuntu-based uh, Linux also called ABC Linux that's used. And then Skill is actually a piece of software that was in the original payroll. They formed the company. OpenSSI takes literally hundreds and thousands of copies of Linux and makes them all look like you're talking to a single OS. You don't know whether it's a million copies on 30 or not. So they've got some very interesting things out there. Next slide. And then, of course, uh, we've been focused on compute. But remember, data is also important to feed that compute. Uh, these are just some of the file systems that have been inspired and then come from the uh, Linux community. Uh, recently, at uh, the Michigan Music Group, there was a talk on the set file system. Luster is very, very, very popular. And the big data folks, they use Hadoop file systems. Again, written in open source and uh, takes your classic nodes you have minimal Unix on it, spread the data out, let it get chopped it, and uh, put everything back. Next slide. Um, yeah, one more. Uh, there's a, a couple of uh, graphics out here. How were they arranged? In the beginning, they were mostly single processors. So this is about 93. As you can see, um, then this blue one out here is the clusters. Clusters sort of appeared maybe in 98 with running Linux. And guess what? They are now the dominant uh, thing. And this little purple one is massively parallel machines. These are special machines. They are in a single rack, but they've got lots of little processors inside. They just have a single rack. That's why they're called massively parallel machines in the single. But even they, from some dominance, are now sort of becoming you know, down to one particular section. And then there are a few special ones. SMP were just big fat processors that were very fast. Well, they had dominance for a long time, but now they're practically gone. We don't use them anymore. No one makes them anymore for our kind of work. Next slide. They just keep hitting uh, more in the animations out there. Um, and then, of course, operating systems. Uh, this was one of the major points. Uh, it has to be Linux. There is nothing else. Uh, surprisingly, uh, Windows does make uh, a small appearance, and I can tell you, you can count the implementation of Windows. It's probably a dozen out of the top 500 systems, and all of them are in the financial industry. You actually go to New Jersey or Connecticut, where the Morgan Stanley or whatever their modern day incarnation is, they'll have data centers with you know, a couple of rooms and lots of machines, and they're running Windows. I suppose that want their Excel spreadsheet to run faster. <laughs> um, and, and then Linux is this uh, magenta color, as you can see, again, around 98 or so, first time. 
and it's now basically occupied everything. Unix, traditional Unix is still there and it'll probably remain at that for long, many years to come. But this is the de facto that you have. Today, Linux and high performance computing are practically synonymous. Next slide. A uh, few more things that I wanted to share with you. Uh, oh, yeah, you can skip that. It was a duplicate uh, uh, one more. Yeah, this is good. Now, within Linux, we'd like to know what sort of uh, distros or distributions they are, um, and, or in Unix and Linux. So these are the variations of uh, Unix and Linux up there. As you can see, this green one, it had something, and then it's grown. And the rest of these are all the Unix ones. Next slide. Um, let's see. Uh, OK, yeah, here are the distros. So here's your CentOS up here. Uh, slash 9 is out here. Um, let's see, uh, this, and slash 10 uh, with some extensions that are out here. And this is plain vanilla uh, Linux, the brown one. So as you can see, there are a few other Linux distributions. But plain vanilla Linux is uh, the one. And this is like Red Hat or Ubuntu, any of those, uh, you know, you can characterize. But these ones are specially crafted, the same class and slash. So that's why they have a little uh, small distribution there. Next slide. Can you do a little analysis on that graph uh, in terms of uh, what's, there was a big orange part now. Yeah. What was that? Uh, there, there are two versions of this. This is a tree map of the previous one and the one previous to that. There are two ways we count it. Because it's high performance computing in the top 500, the first is how many systems have that. So it's an ordinal count. The other graph that shows the same distribution but with uh, some varying the size of the colors is, okay, you have more systems, but which is the most powerful one? That should have a more bigger proportion of the distribution of where Linux dominates. And so that's a different graph by performance share. So you might have a small system with 32 nodes and you might have a hundred of those, but each of those 32 nodes, they only have so much power, they probably account for 10% of the entire list because the top one has about a million processors. So the, these graphs are arranged by two different counts here. Just so that uh, we look at that as capability versus capacity. How many counts do you have? And, but which one is the more powerful one? So that was the explanation. And this one is the one I like the best. We call this a tree map here, which is just simple count of the top 500. And as you can see, some variation of Linux they practically dominate. And the size of these squares indicate if they are very, very powerful systems. Like these three, they're in the top 10 of those 500. Uh, next slide. OK, uh, currently, the biggest system out there has 560,000 cores. Huh. That's a lot of cores. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, they always break all the time, so they actually have a few extra ones that they use it. That's actually at Opry. It's from the Cray, uh, company Cray. It actually has a name type in that. If you look at a picture or Google it, it's got some nice graphic uh, skin on it. But Besides these uh, cores, these are, by the way, AMD cores, if those of you who are curious. It has also bolted on about 260,000 graphic accelerators. It's those two combined together that give it the performance of, you know, 17.59 quadrillion calculations per second. Number two is at Lawrence, but that uh, actually has more cores, but they're actually IBM cores, and they're slower clock speed. Thank you. And, uh, <laughs> yes, uh, certainly uh, they actually do use it for a lot of visualization work. Yeah. Uh, next slide. So, uh, and then a couple of applications. Uh, I do have five minutes. I don't know, it says 15. What time do you have it? It finishes at 6.50. I mean, yeah, I got it. I have 6.46. Yeah, so that's what mine says too. So it said five minutes. They need talk synchronization algorithms. <laughs> well, she goes around for five minutes saying so that. Keep going, keep going. But these are the applications. The one I'm familiar with, and which is happens in southeastern Michigan. Uh, yeah. I just hit cancel out there. Yeah. Um, okay. Go to the next slide um, and see if you can click on this. It should run. Uh, 
There's a little graphic here. Uh, now go back on the slide, or maybe let me operate it from there. It's not that I Here, it's not that I Press continue rather than cancel because I think you got out of Ah, there we go. So, is this the first time PenguinCon has crashed a car? <laughs> Virtually, yeah. <laughs> okay, so let's. Need a faster processor. Now, use a better interface here. Come on. It's kind of like Windows. If you don't. No, no. This is the you best. If you look at the letters where you get the figure icon, because the arrow icon is not doing something for you. Or maybe not. You know what? I will abort this. It seems to be stuck right now. Or, 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 yeah, it's stuck here. You still need it in there? Um, I'll tell you what. I'll talk to the folks and see if I can upload the video of this so you guys can check it out. But uh, I don't know what has to do this. Windows. Yeah, yeah, probably. probably. The first thing you said, cancel, don't let it show the possibly horrific stuff. Yeah, but now I don't even have my cursor. Uh, it's Windows and saw the word crash. So. Yeah, it is. <laughs> <laughs> it's OK, do it. OK, so well, what happens in this is, in the old days, 1936, when you wanted to test cars, there was an actual <coughs> guy who would hold the steering wheel, run it, and he would crash the wall. He'd jump off at the last minute. Oh the videos that I have uh, actually show that we don't do that anymore. We actually virtually crash it, and there's Linux and high-performance computing that uh, let us uh, do that very, very easily. I'll just reboot the thing and talk through the crashing just because it's really dark. Seems. Crash because it's dark. Um, and uh, uh, what we do is uh, we use uh, something. In the early days, about a thousand cores, and this was about 1999 or 2000, thousand cores, and we could simulate that entire crash and we produce video and actually see. And in those days, it would cost half a million to do a physical crash. But with uh, Linux and high performance computing, if you really want to add up the cost of the data center software and everything, it's about $5,000 each crash. Mm -hmm. And the beauty of it is. We've got it down to an art where it's down to the millimeter. It matches a physical crash. We can actually predict this is where the metal will bend. This is where uh, things will deform. Everything. So even the US government will accept virtual testing wow. of any vehicle. And at the end, they, you'll just do one physical test. In the past, we'd have to do a number of physical tests, and they would cost $80 million a year. Now we do perhaps maybe $5 million a year, the physical just to satisfy. So it saves us a lot of money. Okay, let me see if we can put that back. Okay, you know what? I will do better. I will do better. Let me go back to the uh, this. Oh, right at it. I actually will see if I can play oh, that VLC yeah. or something. Oh, yeah. I don't see VLC. Yeah, it's a certain thing the software in the home. But there are just many, many applications that we actually do. Okay. Uh, this particular application, as you can imagine, we calculate a lot of things. This is your fuel tank, and this is all the vapor that's uh, created out there. We did that so that we could simulate where exactly is the danger so that gas tanks won't explode, you know, when you're filling it. So we minimize the vapor. So that's 
one example of Linux and HPC at work. Um, here's a physical car crash, I think. Yep, that you can recognize as being a minivan. And that's a one of the standard tests. We call that a uh, offset uh, barrier test. And we calculate all the things that go on with it. Let's see, there's another one. Uh, you might recognize this one. We calculate all the water that's hitting this. And uh, so let me just kind of you know, go back to the main slide up here. Ah, <coughs> shit. <laughs> uh, <laughs> That was a technical term. Quick review of the slides. There'll be a quiz at the end.